I don't want to steal the show, and I'd like to stay in the back, but I just feel in this day and time that we've been living in, um, you don't know the, the pressure that Dave has been under and as his wife as that I've been under. Um, Dave and I went to the same grade school. We dated in high school and we'll have our 43rd wedding anniversary in June. So I've, I've <laughs> we have three children and 10 grandchildren, which are God's best gift of all, those grandkids. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to have the opportunity to thank those of you who have prayed for us. And I want to encourage you to stand firm to um, let the truth be known to the young people around you and why we stand on that truth that never changes. Our forefathers understood that, and I'm not sure our young people are getting that message today. So it's your job, just as the Bible tells us, that we tell one generation to the next. That's the blessing that we have, that we want our generations behind us to know truth. And I want to encourage you to, to pray for spiritual awakening in our country, and I'm sure most of you are, but I have never realized until now how important that is. I never thought Dave and I would ever be standing in a place like this upholding the true virtues and principles that we grew up with. And here we are. And I'm realizing God doesn't take somebody special. He just takes those who are willing. So it doesn't matter what your vocation is or where you are. God's placed you there for a purpose. And we are to be light and salt. And I pray that for you as we go forward into this battle that I never thought we'd be waging. But praise God, I'm so thankful you're here and thankful for your prayers. Uh, you can see behind every successful man there's a good woman. So, uh, and she's a prayer warrior. She gets up every morning and uh, opens up her Bible, and she's out there praying and reading, which I appreciate. But I'd like to start out just uh, with one thing here, and I think this is a call to our nation. First, it's Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven will forgive their sins and heal their land. Folks, we need a lot of healing here. And I think uh, as I get into this discussion, you're going to find that I really feel um, the silence of the church on some of these issues to me is deafening. Simply deafening. We've got to come out. We've got to start getting involved. I would encourage every one of you, even though it's, you maybe not, don't feel like you should get involved, get involved in the political process. Become a delegate. Change that from the inside out, not from the top down. Because there's too much of the top down stuff going on. The grassroots in the state of Michigan are what's going to change the, the parties. And there's a huge difference between the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. But Edmund Burke said, all that's necessary for evil to succeed is for good men to do nothing. So I want to ask you, what have you done? Uh, what have you done? you got to get involved. Uh, we're at war today. Most people don't even know we're at war. Today, good is called evil. Evil is called good. There's a war of, of words and ideals going on today within the family. And the war is fought in that, the arena of public opinion. The public opinion is swayed greatly, in my opinion, by Hollywood, the media, and the schools. And just to get off a little bit, give you an idea just how fast this is moving on a different subject, there was a recent Pew uh, poll discovered that 55% of the Hispanics, uh, both legal and illegal in the United States today, only 55% believe in capitalism. Folks, this is unbelievable. That's what made America great is capitalism, not socialism. All my life, 26 years in the military, I always had to be prepared to fight and die, and it was always against socialism and communism. So that's been a big issue for me. Look at the recent Grammy Awards. You, anybody watch that? Halftime? Queen Latifah? You know what she did? She married a whole bunch of gays and lesbians at halftime. And, or in the halftime, or in the Grammys. 
So you can see they're shoving it at us in every respect. Your kids are getting it on the television. They're getting it at school and definitely in the movies. And I, I challenge you to turn on the television and just watch two or three programs. And you will always find in those programs there will be a gay or lesbian in those, in those movies or those programs. So... We're being indoctrinated. Our young generation uh, has been indoctrinated, indoctrinated against the principles. I think that our forefathers, uh, if they saw what was going on today, they'd absolutely abhor it. They, they wouldn't believe we're even talking about this. 20 years ago, I didn't think we'd be talking about this. Uh, so the question is, what am I and what are you going to do? Uh, so he, he gave me some things he wanted me to talk about. I may deviate a little bit here and there. But uh, I just want you to know that... Uh, I got involved with politics basically because I didn't like politicians. Uh, as, a, as a fighter pilot, I always got angry when I saw how they made rules of engagement. Anybody know what rules of engagement, how you can fight, how you can't fight? Uh, and it always angered me. Uh, and I felt politicians ought to have their fannies out there getting shot at or whatever, and they changed their tune in a real hurry. So I got involved with politics because one, I didn't like politicians and, and when I heard them speak, I'm not sure what they said when they were done and I'm not sure they knew what they said when they were done. So uh, what happened is, is I, uh, I hurt my back. Well, let's back up a little bit. I went to Calvin College. Anybody heard of that? Uh, I got a degree in economics from them. Uh, I decided I wanted to fly and uh, uh, my wife said she wasn't going to marry anybody unless I had the military behind them or the war in Vietnam was going on strong. So she married me, and two weeks later, I went in the military. So I went through pilot training, and I, I got selected. Uh, based on how you graduate, I could fly anything I wanted to. So I picked an F-4 to fly. Uh, and that was kind of my dream, always to fly airplanes. So that was kind of a childhood dream. And, and my father was a factory worker. We didn't have the money for flight school or anything like that. So that was my way of doing it. I loved flying, uh, and I enjoyed it. I spent about seven and a half years flying active duty. And then I spent another seven and a half years flying in Air National Guard. I got out of the active duty in 78, got in the guards in 78. At the same time, I got hired by American Airlines. And I flew with them. Uh, I was with them almost 30 years. So, and I was in the Air Force about 26 years total. So I got a lot of time in the military. Uh, and while I was in the military, I got my master's degree in business. So consequently, when I got elected into office, my biggest thing was I hate the way government spends money. I just detest it. So uh, what happened is I lost my job, my ability to fly because of back surgeries. Very common for fighter pilots. You squish your disc in your back. And I had a, I had a church league basketball game one day. And I got hit from behind and my head hit my left knee. I can't touch my toes, folks. I still can't. So it sounded like a ripping sound on my back. I ripped the hamstring almost off the bone. I got a hernia and I got a ruptured disc all at the same time. Eleven surgeries later and a whole bunch of uh, time passed. And finally they said, you got to stop flying. So I couldn't fly anymore. So then what happened is uh, I was working with uh, Butterball Farms. I knew the guy who ran Butterball Farms. Not turkey, but butter. And uh, I was working with some inner city youth. And he said, hey, Dave, you ought to come and help me start a machine shop. So I decided, okay, I'll do that. I don't know anything about it, but I'll do that. So I, that's where I learned about illegal immigration. I hired six individuals. I paid 38% override. I hired six people. And uh, 90 days later, I went to uh, hire these people. And I found out they were all illegals. So I had to let them go. So I, I wasted 90 days of training on a mill and a lathe teaching these guys. And we lost money. So I fired that temp agency, hired another temp agency. I said, don't send me any illegals. All we want, we check them all out. So they sent me two guys the next day. Uh, by the end of the day, I checked them out. They were illegal. And then that guy said, well, there's 200 of us working right down the street in the uh, factory. How come nobody's doing anything about that? I said, I can't deal with that, but I can deal here because it's a $10,000 fine, although the government doesn't, doesn't uh, do that very often because they don't have enough man manpower. So that's why when I finally decided to run for office, when my, uh, my forerunner, Representative uh, Ben Rigamorter, quit, uh, I decided to run on a couple different issues. One, I wanted to get rid of onerous laws and taxes that were driving businesses out of the state, because that's what it does. Uh, 
And two, I want to stop illegal immigration because it's a fiscal issue. According to FAIR, Federation for American Immigration Reform, uh, in 2010, I think we spent about $929 over and above what they pay in taxes for their health care, education, welfare, jails, and human services. So that's almost a billion dollars. And it's a fiscal issue. It's a jobs issue. Uh, most people say, well, they're all doing jobs that we don't want to take. Actually, only 3% work on farms illegals. 97% work on roads, bridges, roofing, dr drywall, painting, and things like that. Those are jobs Michigan citizens need. And it's a security issue. We have to know who comes into this country and what they carry. So that's what I ran on, and I won heartily, and handily, rather, I should say. Uh, and then when I got into office, we were in the minority at the time, uh, and they hated my guts. The Democrats just hated me because I was so conservative. When I looked at a budget, if I could find that they were raising a tax fine or a fee, I wouldn't vote for it. Because as any budget in this state, I can find you waste, fraud, and abuse. So if anybody tells you they're cut to the bone, don't believe it, folks. It's just not there. It can be cut. So I did that, and then we got majority after about four years. Uh, and in the majority, then uh, I was the one that put the bill in that the governor reluctantly signed that says we're not paying same-sex unmarried benefits to our state employees. He did not want to sign that bill. But he was forced to because of all the public outrage. So uh, after six years, I decided, okay, I'm going to get out of this. And I thought I'm just going to quit because my wife said we never came here to be a career politician. Uh, and then I was approached, will you run for the RNC? I said, what's the RNC? He says, well, uh, and he explained it a little bit. And I said, well, what's it pay? He said, nothing. I said, what's the expenses? He said, nothing. I said, why do I want to do this? And he said, well, you can get conservatives like yourself elected. I said, I like that. Uh, and also you can weigh in on judgeships. You can do that. Uh, and your job is to basically try to make a cohesive uh, GOP, if you will. And there's a lot of things we do to raise money for the GOP. Uh, but my biggest thing that turned me on to that was I could try to get fiscal, moral, and constitutional conservatives elected. That's my goal. So I basically vet people. I have a little fund called Top Gun Conservative PAC. And people that give me money, I put that in that money in there and I use that for some expenses, but I also use it to give to people that I think are fiscal, moral, and constitutional conservatives. And I try to get them into office. And that doesn't go over real well sometimes when uh, some of the people that you're uh, giving the money to are running against somebody that's already in office. But I do it anyway. Because I think uh, some of the people that are there, uh, the term rhino has come up, Republican in name only, you heard. Uh, some of those people get there by making promises to their constituents, but then when they get there, they do a complete flip. And I can name them, but I won't. I've seen it, and it's usually because of lobbyist money. And that's why I got very involved here a while back in part-time legislature. 92% uh, of the states have some type of part-time legislature. Uh, and we just got that approved from the Board of Canvassers. So if we can get 400,000 signatures in 90 days, that'll be on the ballot and you'll get the vote on that. And trust me, folks, who here knows? What's the only thing by the state of Constitution required by the state Constitution? Anybody know? A budget. That's the only thing. So how many people are on appropriations? That's the budget. About 25% of the people. So what's the rest of the people doing? New laws, new fines, new fees, new things they can think of. Trust me, when they're there all the time, they can think of a lot of things. And they make hundreds of new bills a year. I think last year, uh, Norm Comrade told me they came up with, not all these got passed, but they came up with 15 to 1,800 new bills that they produced, of which, I forget, two or 300 were signed into law. Sometimes you have five or 600 signed into law. Folks, we're losing our freedom one law at a time. We're losing our income one tax at a time. You don't want them there. You're safest when we're not in session. And think of this, think of this as a part-time legislature, uh, what are the lobbyists going to do for nine or ten months of the year? I mean, that's how they get, they got everybody in Lansing right there. So the lobbyists are knocking on your door, promising you money. If you vote this way, vote that way, we can help you out so you can get reelected. So what happens is your reelection is more important than doing what's right for your citizens. That's what's going on there. So uh, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself there probably a little bit. But uh, what I wanted you to know is that Obama really bothers me. And, and the Democrat Party really bothers me. Our platform is a good platform. And then there's a Democrat platform. If you would read both side by side, it is a world of difference. The problem is, as, as Republicans, we're not maintaining the platform quite as well as we should. There lies the issue.
So that's kind of where I take a stand on, on the uh, homosexual marriage issue. I took a stand on that one. Boy, did I get slapped in the face in a big hurry. And the first one, uh, just, I'm just going to just tell you, the first one that I posted was about a year ago, and it was by Dr. Joseph. It was an older article, but I was reading it in bed, actually, and I reposted it on my Facebook page. So the homosexuals, the LGBT groups, have war rooms, literally war rooms, when they see anybody that's trying to fight against their lifestyle. They put it on their uh, iPad or their phone, call to action, make 100 calls to Snyder, make 100 calls here, put emails there. They're good at what they do. Here, we're a Christian people. We got churches. We don't do it. We just sit there and let it happen. We're not organized like they are. So uh, I'm just telling you, Obama says, God bless America. And then he says he wants to kill our unborn. He pushed the LGBT agenda, and his own party tried to men, uh, take the mention of God out of their platform at their latest convention. He, he pushes socialism. He ruins our economy and jobs with Obamacare and spends more than any other president has. All the while, more people are on, on, on the government dole. So he's already made 17 changes to Obamacare on his own without going through Congress. He broke constitutional law. He can either veto it or sign it. He can't make law. That's why you have three branches of government. We have a dictator in the making here, folks. And it's bad. Uh, and there's an old saying. When, we, when people fear the government, there's tyranny. When the government fears the people, there's liberty. I choose liberty, my folks. We need to tress, stress unity in this nation, not diversity. Most people came like my great grandparents came here to be Americans. They didn't come here to be Dutch Americans or Polish Americans or African Americans. Americans. They learned our language and they lived by our laws. We now have people coming here that have dual citizenship and dual loyalties. It's going to cause problems, folks. Look at Russia, the split up that they got. They had, I forget how many different languages and people. It's causing that country just to come apart. So the Constitution was set in place to limit government expansion. The Constitution was not set in place to limit citizens' freedom. You've got to remember that. Our freedoms come from God. It's the government job to protect those rights, not take them away. So what's your definition of what the purpose of government should be? I can tell you what mine is. The purpose of government is to be there just enough so you can do as much or as little as you want to and then reap the rewards or lack thereof, with a basic safety net, but not a hammock. And it's become a hammock. What do we got? 47% of the people are in some shape or form now are on, on the dole. Now, some of those need it. I'm not saying they shouldn't get it, but there's too many. And pretty soon that will implode, and we can't continue that. Um, can you, let me, let me just get ready to cue up that video. I made a video here a while back, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, before I knew all this dust-up was going to happen. And what I think is happening today is political correctness, as we understand it today, which is coming from Hollywood, the media, and the schools, is taking away our freedom of speech. Because what they did to me, it's called slamming. When they see somebody standing on something or coming against, the, like, the homosexual lifestyle, what they do is get the news media, the newspapers, they have hundreds of people to write in, so newspapers are filled with it. The airwaves are filled with it. Oh, he's homophobic, he's bigoted, he's racist. Folks, I don't hate anybody. I do not hate homosexuals. I do not hate Muslims. But if you're going to come here as a Muslim, you'll live under our laws, not Sharia law. And if you're a homosexual, if I really care for you, and I made this example when I was on the, new, on the radio one day, and they made this a big issue. I said, let me give you an example. If I have my neighbor, and he's a good friend of mine, and he's dying of alcoholism, and I know he's dying, and I can help him. If, if I really care for the guy, I try to do something about it, not just let him die. The same way with the homosexual lifestyle. So when I said that, suddenly they said, Dave Agema compares uh, uh, homosexuality to alcoholism. Well, no, it's not what I was doing. I was trying to show an example if you really care for somebody. So what this is going to, it's kind of long. It's about seven minutes long or so. But what it basically does is tell you we're in trouble because of political correctness. And we're letting it happen because we're not speaking up. And when they put fear and intimidation into, like when you see what's going on with me, what does it make you want to do? Does it make you want to stand up and shout? No, it makes you mean, man, I'm going to go over here and hide in the grass because they're going to do the same thing to me if I speak up. So I made this before all this happened. I think it's even more important than ever.
Have you ever noticed the opposition to free speech and the labeling of discrimination consistently comes from those who want to silence our voices so that their voices and their agenda are the only ones to be heard? They want the exclusive right to be the public forum, the exclusive right to speak and to be heard. So their push for tolerance results in the intolerance of our views. Their position is the only acceptable position. So this raises the question, how do freedom of speech and political correctness interface? Let's explore that question by beginning with a brief history lesson. The founding fathers came from countries on the other side of the ocean where freedom of speech was only for the rich and powerful. Believing that every person had value and dignity, they wanted to directly address the issue of freedom of speech in the United States Constitution. They believed that people needed to be able to freely share their ideas and views so that they would be citizens rather than just subjects. In the First Amendment to the Constitution, the founders wrote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. In other words, every person is entitled to his opinions, perspectives, and ideas. To begin to explore the relationship between freedom of speech and political correctness, permit me to ask a hypothetical question. If a particular group or groups in this country wish to undermine and ultimately remove the right to free speech, and perhaps remove the Constitution itself, what would be an effective approach? Knowing that Americans value equality and fairness, could those values be turned on their heads and be sold as political correctness? That is, in order to be fair to everyone, every opinion, every perspective, goal, and lifestyle should be equal. Never mind if that opinion, perspective, goal, or lifestyle were destructive to the basic framework of society or were diametrically opposed to the principles on which this country was founded. The sales pitch would be, fairness and equality are the highest good. The recent dust-up between A&E television station and Duck Dynasty star Phil Robertson is a perfect example of the conflict between freedom of speech and political correctness. When Duck Dynasty Robertson expressed his personal belief in the biblical definition of marriage between a man and a woman, as opposed to the secular creation of same-sex marriage, A&E fired Robertson for exercising free speech instead of being politically correct. Soon thereafter, when the voice of the American people was heard and the station realized that both freedom of speech and traditional marriage are valued by the majority of Americans, they backed down. Phil Robertson and the American people rejected political correctness and reclaimed their constitutional right to free speech. In the July 15 edition of the Washington Times, Dr. Ben Carson, a nationally renowned neurosurgeon, pointed out that freedom of speech and the basic foundational framework of this society are being attacked by the enforcement of political correctness. He stated, political correctness, which is vigorously enforced, imposes a code of silence that prevents discussion of the game-changing alteration of our fundamental social pillars. These pillars include freedom of speech and the traditional family structure. When equality and fairness are turned on their heads and political correctness rather than honest dialogue is the new standard, civil conversations and differences of opinion are replaced by coercion. And speaking of coercion, have you noticed how the IRS, the NSA, and the media are working to define and mandate how you are to live, how you are to speak, and how you are to think? Our personal freedoms, including the First Amendment, are being threatened. When I took my oath as a military officer and later as a state representative, I committed to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Our politicians have taken that same oath. However, instead of honoring the Constitution, the majority of them are yielding to political correctness. They become part of the problem rather than the solution. Being in both the military and politics, I'm disgusted and dismayed with those who capitulate to political correctness for the sake of personal gain. They are betraying their oath and undermining the principles on which this country was founded. This country was built on religious principles. President John Adams said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. President George Washington stated, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Our country was built on biblical principles. 
The groups demanding political correctness want not only to remove the freedom of speech and to replace traditional marriage with alternative lifestyles, but also to eliminate religion itself. If they can remove religion, as well as our constitutional rights based on religious principles, they will have removed our personal freedoms and destroyed this nation. Franklin Graham sums it up when he says, political correctness is not so much a cultural war, but a religious war against Christians and the biblical truths that we stand for. So the bottom line is, we need more men and women who are courageous, fearless, and unwavering in their determination to exercise their right to free speech. All of us must refuse to be silenced by the ploy of political correctness. As President George Washington so aptly stated over two centuries ago, if freedom of speech is taken away, then dumb and silent we may be led like sheep to the slaughter. It's time to shun political correctness and dismiss that notion that having a difference of opinion is automatically discriminatory. This is a free country. The First Amendment of our Constitution guarantees each and every one of us the right to free speech. We must unabashedly, unapologetically exercise that right and speak the truth. Well, the interesting thing is that was put together prior to all this dust up because I saw it coming. And they're trying to silence what we can say. But you have to speak. Is that available? Yes, you can go, go on my webpage at daveagema.com. daveagema.com. And that's there, and I'm going to put one of these up about once a month. And I just finished one, but they have to edit it. And that was about, are you all watching the, uh, uh, the Olympics that's going on now? Okay. Uh, did you hear on the news now that they got this anti-gay law? Guess what? My friend Mark Gurley was uh, in Rhodes, Greece when all this came up. And uh, I put that, again, I took flack for this as well. I put on my Facebook uh, what the law was. I said, read this law. Common sense in Russia. Boom! Just blew up. Oh, that's terrible. Asia agrees with Putin, that terrible leader. Read the law. What the law says, if you're young, a young adolescent, you will not hand out pornographic material, or homosexual propaganda, and anything like that to those people, or there's a fine. That's what it says. We ought to have that law. It's a good bill. It's a good law. So, I took flack over that. So th any way they can, they will twist and make it sound like it's really bad when it actually isn't bad. And actually Putin is using this against us. Putin is a smart guy. I don't trust him as far as I can throw him. But he, he's a very smart guy. He, he looks at it this way. If you accept our law, you're pro-Russia. If you don't accept our, our law, you're like that immoral America. And that's how he's using it. But it is a good law. So I took flock for that one as well. So uh, there's a lot of things I can get into here. Uh, one of the things I'd like to say is one of the things I did get passed at the RNC, Republican National Committee, man, Republican National Committee, uh, I got five core principles passed with 100% unanimity. In other words, there was all eyes and no nay votes. And I sat down one day and I wrote down what are the differences that I can really see between a Democrat platform and the Republican platform. I mean that every Christian ought to be able to see and say, hey, we're for this, we're not for that. And I wrote them down, and to, and to my great surprise, I sent them in to the, the lawyer that helps write these things up. He said, they're already in our platform, but this is good because it's five core principles which would distinguish us from the Democrats. And here's what they were. Number one, I mentioned it already. Your rights come from God. It's the government's job to protect those rights. Democratic platform tried to take the mention of God completely out of their platform. Second, uh, we believe in the Second Amendment. It's your right to bear arms. The Democrat, especially Obama, is making it very difficult for you to, to get guns, get bullets, and registration. We talk about registration. I got a list here I could mention to take too much time because I know you want to have questions and answers later. But if you add up all the countries that once they have registered the guns, then they took the guns, there's over 50 million people that have been, been killed by their own government once they took those guns. That's almost the exact number we have killed through abortion. has been killed once they took the guns. So, and the third thing was, we believe in the sanctity of life. What do the Dems believe in? They believe in abortion in any term, if they could get away with it. 
And the fourth was, we believe in traditional marriage, not homosexual marriage. Hillary Clinton, Obama are going to other countries saying, contingent on our giving you money, you must push this agenda. I have an issue with that. When has a president ever done that in our history? And especially one that claims to be a Christian. So, the fifth one was, the fifth one was, we believe in legal immigration, not illegal immigration. I went through that a while back here. Because it costs us security, jobs, and the fiscal issues. And what are the Dems trying to do? Obama in particular. They are trying to go ahead and give amnesty. Now, if you look back in the history in 1985, we did this once before. And we gave amnesty. It doubled our problem. Already now, they are piling up on the, on the outskirts of the United States waiting for this to happen. They'll come across and they'll get amnesty. Uh, and if you use his numbers, uh, the CBO said, if there's only 11.9 million, I got news for you folks. There's a lot more than 11.9 million. There's probably closer to 25 or 30 million illegals in the United States. But if you use his numbers of 11.9 million, and they all get to take their wives, their kids, and their relatives. Now this is CBO now. They said in 10 years you'll have an extra 25 to 30 million people. If my numbers are right, it'll be closer to 50 million people. You won't recognize America 50 in 10 years. That's just in 10 years. And what we've pretty much figured out they vote on an average 8 to 1 Democrat. So if they pass that, in my opinion, in Washington, the Republicans have just committed suicide because they, they're going to lose this. So all I can tell you is I fear if they do some of the things that they are intending to do, America will not be the same. Obama's idea of America is not mine. He's regulating the agenda. His regulations and, and agenda and so forth in the, in the government right now have cost us, just on his regulations, $1.8 trillion a year. The EPA is the worst. They've cost us about $379 billion of that $1.8 trillion. Government takes in about $2.5 billion a month but spends much more. Uh, he spends about $18 billion a month on interest at our present interest rate and the real low. Now, if our interest, if, if rates start to rise, that number goes up greatly. Defense has been slashed, uh, but entitlements have exploded. By 2015, Obamacare spending will overtake Social Security as the highest budget item. In short, they spend more than they take in every month and print money to cover it, which will certainly lead to inflation or another cur currency taking our place as the international currency. Now, you already got China's looking at that. The euro is looking at that. They'd love to be the international currency. Because we're just printing money, a trillion a year. I mean, they can't do that. And they have to use American dollars to, to buy things. So, just to put that in perspective, uh, you've probably heard this one before. U.S. tax revenue is $2.2 uh, $2 trillion, roughly. The federal budget is $3.8 trillion. Okay, so the budget's bigger than what they take in. The new debt is roughly about uh, 17 trillion. National debt's about 17 trillion. Recent budget cuts are 38 billion 500 thousand dollars. That's what they did uh, last year when they had these big budget cuts. Well, let's put that in perspective. What's that going to be really like in numbers you can understand? An annual. Imagine if there's somebody here that's making 21 thousand 700 dollars a year. That kind of equates to the 21 or 22 trillion. But the family spends $38,200 a year. So that means the new debt on their credit card is $17,000 that year. Outstanding balance on the credit card, all the past debt, is $170,000. Remember, they're only making $21,000. But we made a total budget cut of $38.50. You, you get where I'm getting at? When they talk about these little cuts, it's nothing. It's a pittance. And sometimes they talk about we're cutting the budget. They're actually cutting the increase of the budget that they wanted to pass. That goes on in the state as well. So another way of looking at it is to say, okay, you come home from work and there's been a sewer back up in your neighborhood and your home has sewage all the way to the ceilings. So what do you do? Do you raise the ceilings or do you remove the sewage? You remove the sewage. So just to give you some more stats and we'll get into some questions here in a minute and I want to talk about Alec too because I know you wanted me to talk about that. Uh, I know this is going to go right by some of you, but just kind of get an idea of the numbers. The current national debt, $17.2 trillion. The added to the national debt since uh, Obama took office is $6.6 trillion. Uh, the cost of Obamacare coverage uh, provisions from 2014 to 2023 is $1.8 trillion. 
Total taxes in Obamacare, additional taxes, were $819.3 billion. The amount of regulatory extra burdens since Obama took office is costing us $518 billion. The increased cost to pay interest on our debt since 2009 is $32.6 billion. Americans receiving food stamps, $47 million. Americans living in poverty, a record number, $46.5 million. The number of Americans that have joined the food stamp program since Obama took office is 14.1 million. Americans who received cancellation notices for their health care due to Obamacare is 5 million. The number of people that have entered poverty since Obama became president is 1.2 million. The amount of construction jobs lost since Obama took office are 703,000. Manufacturing jobs lost since Obama took office are 542,000. The debt per capita for American at the end of 2013 was 54,360. $6. The increase of debt per capita for Americans since uh, he took office is 19537 So that's the additional that each person sitting here that you owe the federal government. Think about that. Increase in health care premiums. Remember, you can keep your health care, and it's going to cost you $2,500 less. The average increase in family health care premiums since Obama took office is $3,671. The increase in the average price per gallon of gas since Obama took office is 79.6. I'd like to talk about that one. What about the pipeline? Shouldn't we have that? What about drilling everywhere we could? People say, yeah, we're producing more gas and oil. But did you know that Obama stopped by 30% the amount of oil drilling permits on federal land, but it's been the private land that they've drilled more on. So it's the entrepreneur that's putting out more, not the federal government. Our unemployment rate right now, they say, is 7%. It's not accurate. Because the 7% doesn't include all the people that have termed out of unemployment insurance. So you're probably closer to 11%. And how many years did Obama already know that you couldn't keep your premiums or c couldn't keep your insurance? Three years he knew that, but he kept telling you the same story. So if they say something often enough, long enough, uh, you'll start to believe it just because they've told you that so many times. And how many people have been fired since uh, the Obamacare disaster? Anybody know? None. Absolutely none. And then I'd like to just, uh, if I could, just read real short, shortly this, uh, this particular person sent me this letter, and I think it deserves to be read. It's obvious what's happening. There are a few progressives who have taken the low road and tried to silence, demonize, bully, intimidate, and alienate platform Republicans. We shouldn't stand for it. We shouldn't bow, bow to it. We are on the right side of history. What does it mean to be a Republican? An incredible gift has been given to us by those who have gone before. A great Republican founded in the principles of the Judeo-Christian values, liberty. The Republican platform in 2012 is amazing. From the preamble, the principles written in the Constitution are secured by the character of the American people. President George Washington had said in his first inaugural address, the, the, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right with heaven itself which heaven itself has ordained. Values matter. Character counts. The GOP has been charged with the care and the nurturing of the republic. <clears throat> the Democrats have chosen the low road of selfishness, godlessness, tyranny, and ruin. So it's up to us, and sadly, a fork in the road faces us. What do we do now will decide if we, as a party, were worthy of our gift. So we must ask ourselves, are we going to veer from our virtuous path because of the hysterics, cries, and lies of a few loud-mouthed, shady malcontents? Do we not know that they will continue their dangerous and childish attacks on all virtues of our party until there's nothing left? Do we slay part of our soul just to calm the waters? <coughs> Providence has put us at this fork in the road, and we must answer the question, if not us, who? If not now, when? I thought that was a pretty good article that she wrote. So with that, I can go into a whole lot of other things, but I'd like to talk real briefly, if I could, on, on uh, uh, the uh, ALEC, American Law for American Courts. Anybody heard of that? Who wrote that? Uh, her name was Isabel Terry. She's a GOP state committee person. She's a Tea Partier. Uh, ALEC, American Law for American Courts. I put that bill in uh, when I was a state uh, legislator. Is we found that throughout the United States there's been about 72, 73 cases now where people went into a court of law and they lost their constitutional rights because the progressive liberal judge used foreign law to adjudicate a case instead of our constitutional law. And I believe 50 of those were Sharia law. 
One of the cases would be, uh, I think it was in New Jersey, where the lady was getting beaten by her husband because under Sharia law, you can beat your wife. And uh, she went to get a separation order. Uh, and the guy basically said, well, according to my religion, I can do this. So the judge agreed. And she had to go to the appeals court to get that reversed. Folks, there's a lot of things in Sharia law that are bad. And it's anathema to our constitution. It's absolutely the opposite. Uh, so if you ask people, uh, there are good Muslims, don't get me wrong. There are good Muslims that don't agree with this. When I had this American Law for American Courts bill, we had people come from all over the state. Uh, we had about 160 people in a room that's only meant to hold about 145 in the capital. And one lady that came was a Muslim. And she said, I came to this country to get away from Sharia law. I agree with Dave Bill. And there are several states that have passed this bill. A lot of people will say it's not necessary because we have a supremacy clause. My point is, it's the duty of the legislature to basically identify a law and make it a criteria for those judges. If this law is passed, we are putting those judges on notice. You will not use foreign law if it causes anybody in your court to lose their constitutional rights. We have another way to get rid of them uh, if we push this bill. So it was not passed. A representative Hooker has took, taken that bill now. I think it's going to be buried again. I don't think they're going to pass it. Uh, we do have the largest concentration of Muslims in the United States sitting in Dearborn. Sooner or later, this is going to happen. We had some Christians get stoned. Actually, there were Muslims that became Christians that were handing out uh, tracts and so forth on the sidewalk. They were actually thrown in jail, and they won the case. They had to come back, but they had to fight. They should have never been thrown in jail for that. So we're in a battle. And we're in a battle for the heart and the soul of Christianity in this country. And I'm just telling you, pray for your leaders. Please pray for your leaders. And uh, I got in trouble also one time. Uh, I put on there, pray for the president. Pray for all the congressmen. If they, don't if they don't change, pray Psalm 109 verse 8. Anybody know what that says? May his days be few, may another take his place. <laughs> Well, then I had a Grand Rapids Press guy call me and say, you know what's in that chapter? I said, I know exactly what's in that chapter. Well, the rest of that chapter talks about his children becoming fatherless. That means you want to kill the president? I said, no, I didn't quote that part. I said, I just quoted that one part. May his days be few. May he have less days in office. May another win. That's what I want. I want somebody else to win. Well, he tried to just nail me to that one as quick as he could, but it didn't work. So all American Law, court, American law for American Courts does is tell that Tell that uh, judge, you're going to use Constitution. You're not going to use foreign law. Now, I can get into real depth. There's a thing called comedy, where if our Constitution doesn't meet, uh, doesn't speak about a particular thing, they can use comedy. In other words, they can accommodate a foreign law. And in that bill also, it doesn't prevent companies that want to do business in a Muslim country from agreeing to the, the rules that they have in that country. Those are all exceptions to the law. So there should have been no problem with it whatsoever. But there was. People complain. Uh, the Catholic Church complained that maybe uh, that would affect their canon law. It does not. There's an exception to it. It does not affect canon law whatsoever. Matter of fact, our constitutional laws were based on Judeo-Christian ethics, so it doesn't affect it. But there's a lot of other things I can get into. <clears throat> I won't. I'm going to open it up for questions because I know you have questions. <clears throat> yes, sir. Part-time legislature. You mentioned earlier about the part-time legislature. Mm -hmm. um, our, where can we get petitions? I'll circulate them. Okay. Before we leave, anybody who's willing to do that, make sure when you do it that they're signed correctly because all it takes is one name from a different county that's signed on there. Uh, and they throw out the whole bunch of, bunch of uh, signatures. Monday they're being printed and they should be ready to be sent out by Tuesday. So if anybody's interested, uh, you can write on the back of one of my pieces of paper, your name, address, and so forth. We need to get those signatures. Uh, I guarantee you, we did the polls. If this goes and it makes it to the ballot, it, this thing polls 85% positive. That's the way it is. 85% of the people roughly believe that this is a good thing. And I'm going to tell you right now, people are going to come out against it. The lobbyists will come out against it because they don't have a job. Tim Skubik is going to come out against it because he don't have a job only two months a year. He won't have nothing to say on television. Uh, and another thing, think of this. If you're a part-time legislature like most of the other states and you're back in your district, you've got a regular job, you're going to vote totally different. And, and I, another thing, if we get far enough into this, why couldn't I vote from home on a secure computer? Boy, that would really confuse the lobbyists. And if you want to see, just as a, as a test, 
If you look at a, a, a legislator, a senator, a representative, and he's got a whole bunch of money in his committee to elect, watch his voting record. Generally speaking, if they voted liberal, they voted with a lot of lobbyists, and the lobbyists do a lot of money in their committee to elect because they do what they're told. I had an issue with that. So I had people calling me, and they said, Dave, I know your answer is no, but my job is to bring them up to see you. Will you at least talk to them? I let them say their little word as they walk out the door. I go, nope, I'm not doing that. So that stuff goes on all the time at Lansing. They're not going to be able to do that if they're over here in Fremont. Uh, and what's the lobbyist going to do? Drive to Fremont, drive to Grand Rapids, drive up to the Sioux, drive. The, it's just going to complicate their, and the savings will be in less law, less fines and fees. And the old saying, you are safest when we are not in session. And the average amount of days we're in session when I was there ranked, ranged between 80 and about 95 days a year anyway. So this bill will say you can be there for 60 consecutive days, in other words, two months, and if by reason that you have more things you have to do, you can extend it to 90 days. That's what it does, and it pays them $35,000 a year, and it pays expenses in their district, and they still get a staffer over there in Lansing to answer the phone, so if they have issues, they can get it settled. So I like it. I put that bill in. The very first year I was in as a state representative, I put the resolution in to try to get two-thirds vote. That's what it would take for the legislator to pass it. They had never bring that bill up. And they didn't want to bring it up for two reasons. One, they didn't want to be a part-time legislature. For some of those legislators, it's the best job they ever had. <laughs> they used to bother them when I told the Democrat came up to me one time, and uh, he liked my watch. I said, how do you know about these watches? My son bought me this watch. And uh, I thought, you're supposed to be for the poor people that don't know anything about these watches. And we got to talking about some of this stuff, and uh, he knew more about money and was more interested than I was as a Republican. And all I wanted to do is just cut the budgets so you didn't get taxed anymore. Because, quite frankly, you are taxed too much now. They spend too much. I can't remember where I was going with that. Do you have another question on that or no? Dave, um, we're, we'll have a mic on both sides. But okay. I wanted to ask I, I, uh, one of the things that I... That I picked up on um, when when the uh, the hit especially came recently from West Michigan and the media you, you guys were were off on, on, a, on a getaway on a vacation and um, you knew things were un, were unfolding in not such a pretty way yeah and you it was kind of a crossroads for you I kind of gather I think it would be pe helpful for people to hear I mean you could have you could have said isn't worth it oh and exactly I, yeah tell a little bit about that would you well <clears throat> the third time <laughs> And that was when I posted an article by an individual. Again, I didn't write it. I posted an article another person wrote when Obama said we weren't a Christian nation. And he said, baloney, we're not a Christian nation. And he listed all the things that the Catholic Church did and all these things. And then he went on there. And by the way, in this country we have freedom of religion, something Islam does not permit. And then he went on to say a bunch of things that Islam did. And the last sentence is what they hammered me on that he wrote. I didn't write it. And he said, show me anything that uh, the Muslims did to contribute to society. Now that's the one they're hammering me on, and probably right, rightfully so to a certain extent, because we got doctors, lawyers, and dentists that are there now. But back up, you know how we formed our first navy? Jefferson, the Barbary Coast. What was happening? Our ships and our sailors were being taken and killed by the Muslims. So he's, and then he made 200 copies of the Koran. So you remember the uh, individual that's a Muslim that was just uh, inducted in to be a congressman and he put his hand on the Koran when he took his oath? He said, well, this was Jefferson's uh, copy, as if to say that's a good thing. Jefferson cop made 200 copies of that so people could read it to see what a barbarous people we were dealing with. It was not because it was a good thing. It was because it was a bad thing. And because of that, we formed our first navy. So there's some truth in it. There's, there's not that much history. But there, I don't want to paint with that broad brush saying they're all evil. They're not. Uh, there's some good Muslims that come here to get away. And this is America. You can be any religion you want to be. Okay. Well, when we went away, uh, we were on a cruise ship. I like to go on a cruise ship because I can eat all I want. I don't have to pay for it. I'm Dutch. Uh, and I turned my... my you know, my cell phone's sitting there. But when you're in the belly of a ship, you know, 200 miles offshore, you don't get good coverage. And about three days later, and I saw that Betsy DeVos had called me, and I couldn't get back to her. And then when I tried to get back to her, she didn't answer the phone. So we finally came back, and then she said, I want you to resign. And then she explained why. And I said, well, you know what? I'm not there yet. Because I don't feel if, uh, if I capitulate to this, everybody else is going to capitulate to this. And then my wife said, 
You're too good for this, Dave. Let's just call it quits and get out of here because we don't need this hassle. We got home and when people started calling us and say, please do not capitulate to this because then our party is going to go off in the wrong direction even further. So we stood. But then what happens is big money and big power goes to individuals and says, you will come against Dave or I'm going to make sure you don't get any money. I got that right from Wright's previous mouth. That's what happened to him. They threatened to take several hundred thousand dollars out of their RNC unless they came out against me. So now, just like my movie said, the rich and the powerful, you know, years ago when the people came here, were the only ones that could free speak freely. It's coming to that again. So that's what happened. Uh, I just think it's amazing. We got Benghazi, we got NSA, we got the IRS, we got all these things, but this is the devil's way and this is the Democrats' way to split the party. What should have happened, they should not have fallen into this. They should have said, hey, it's an article he reposted. If you don't like the article, there's other evidence over here. Fine, let's get on with life and let's do it. But they didn't. They capitulated to political correctness. And then when they saw how good they're at making all the negative press, they ran for the hills. Some of these people just ran. I don't want this to happen because i got to win this election. So they fear political correctness. Huge in Lansing. Just huge. But I have to say that just about everybody that came out against me, not one of them uh, wanted, not one of them uh, endorsed me for the RNC and I still won by about 70%. So what can I say? But that was a grassroots effort. <laughs> Any other questions? Just a quick comment sure. on the part-time legislature yep. and how the, the less they do, the better we are. Yeah. Go back to the 1990s when Clinton was impeached, the country, and that's all that Washington was doing. That's when the country's economics was the best. were the best. Absolutely. Because you know why? Business likes stability. And when, they're in, when you're in session, they don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, they don't. Personally... I'm against Obamacare. You probably are too. I'm against Medicaid expansion. We put 470,000 more people on Medicaid because we said you could qualify if you're 130% of the poverty level. Okay, but what do you know that if you are on Medicaid and now you get older, and by the way, I think Norm Hughes told me that a, a family of six, a husband and wife and four kids could qualify under this program now, making about $80,000 a year. Is that poverty? Now, what they're going to do is when you get old and you retire and they finally put you in the ground, the government's going to say, ah, we spent X amount of dollars on you. We spent $400,000 on you over your lifespan. We're going to come and take your assets. Fine print. They're going to come back through the back door and take it again. So beware. There's always, nothing's free. They're going to find a way to take it. You got a question? Uh, my name is Alex Young, and uh, I grew up in this town. And I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say, uh, you know, I grew up in this town, and I, saying 20 years ago, you can't remember thinking that uh, that things would be at this point in this country. And I can see the change in just the last 20 years. And I just, me and my wife, we're a young family, and we just had our first child. And I'm worried about the next, uh, you know, where this country's going at this point. And, you know, I... I would say five years ago, I was with, you know, a uh, Christian in name only, you know. Uh, I'd say I was a Christian, but, you know, the true religion of, of who I was really following was not God. And it was, uh, it was the fact that, you know, the people that brought us the Bible gave up everything that they had. There's Stephen was the first martyr, you know. Paul was beaten three times. And, uh, you know, even our Lord and Savior, Jesus was crucified. You know, they did not like him. And uh, I just wanted to thank you for standing up. And I think that, you know, we definitely do need more people like you to stand up. And I think that since you're a lightning rod, it's going to bring more attention to you. But I, I definitely, I was tired tonight. I didn't want to come. But, you know, I heard you. I was excited to hear that you were coming. And I, I appreciate you being a, an American because, you know, as uh, Patrick Henry said, give me your liberty or give me death. You know, on this, I'm going to bear my cross daily. So thank you. You should have had him come and speak. Him and my wife would have been a great team right there. <laughs> uh, 
Yes. I'm Gene Walter, and uh, we get uh, calls continually about uh, sending the money for the Republican Party and everything. Could you advise us on how to work through, as Christians, between the Tea Party principles and the uh, Republican Party, which wants to separate themselves from that Tea Party. Is that well, a fair question? One of the, yeah, it is. But see, when I took over the RNC position, it was not only to get fiscal, moral, and constitutional conservatives elected, it was also to bridge that gap between the Tea Party, the I Caucus, the 912 groups, the C4 groups, and all those groups to keep them in the GOP and to tell them to work within the system from the bottom up. And if you could do that, pizza coming up on me. Uh, <clears throat> If you can do that, you can change it from within. So I think the platform is solid, but there are a minority of groups within the party that want to move that left. And when I ran for this position and I was running all around there at Cobo Hall talking to all the districts, it's the first thing I said is, we're drifting left. I don't want to drift left. I want to move that party back to the right. Because in Ecclesiastes, says the, Ecclesiastes it says what the, uh, the heart of the fool tends to the left, but the heart of the righteous to the right. And I said, that's where we got to go. We got to plant our feet and not keep capitulating to the left. If we do, the last election we had 3 million, which happens to be about the same number of the popular vote, if you just count that, that uh, Romney lost. 3 million people didn't bother to vote that were GOPers. They just sat home. Cause they, uh, and, and I told Reince previous when I was there, when I got those five core values uh, passed, I said, if we don't stand especially on marriage and the family. This country is going to be destroyed because the, the primary rule or basic rule of government is the family. When you destroy the family, you destroy the nation. So I said, you got to do this or you're going to lose another 5 million people that aren't going to vote and we're going to look just like the Democrats. And people are already saying, hey, I don't see that much of a difference. The platforms are hugely different. But uh, I think there's a tendency to want to go left. And the people that caused me most of my problems in the news were Republicans that brought this up. And there's just two or three of them. And they're the ones that sent all this stuff out to cause the problems. But they want to move it to the left. They want to include, you know, they don't want just traditional marriage. So I think what you need to do, and I tell everybody, write letters to the editor. Uh, write your representatives. Write your senators in the state. Even write your federal people. Because they're being told the same thing. You got to do this or we're going to withhold money. It's always about money and power, folks. Always about money and power. And I remember when I first got elected, <clears throat> uh, Ben Rigermore had told me, I said, I don't like raising money for politics. I'll raise money for orphanages and the church. And I, I do work with some orphans in Guatemala. I said, but I just hate raising it for politics. He said, get over it, Dave. Money is the mother's milk of politics. You don't have it, you can't win. So what do you have? You have people like uh, Upton, for example, in, in the south of here, who's got in his uh, campaign committee to elect somewhere around $1.6 million. Now, how does somebody else who wants to run against him going to win? And by the way, they asked me to run against him. That was last, uh, what, a year ago? It was in 2012, I guess it was. Uh, I was driving home from Lansing one day, and Club for Growth called me and said, we want you to run against Upton. I said, I don't live in that district. He said, you don't have to. I said, you don't? No, as a congressman, did you know that? You don't have to live in the district? You didn't know that. And they wanted me to run against him. He said, you've got the most conservative record. He's got the most liberal record. We want you to run against him. I said, I don't want to do that. I said, I don't want to, I don't want to be in politics that long. So I flipped him over to Jack Hogendyke, and then Jack Hogendyke ran against Upton. He got beat pretty bad. Again, no money. So money drives. But people vote. So, yeah, a rich person can give a lot of money to try to, to do news ads and television ads. But that's one vote. You just can't be deceived by what they're doing. You gotta vote the correct way. I um, have a question and a comment. Um, human trafficking, trafficking has started to seem to snowball as far as awareness. Um, is there great concern in either party, GOP, Democrats, for yeah. that problem? Yeah, Shooty's pretty much on top of that right now. He's really going after human trafficking. And you, you probably heard uh, on that NFL game, you know, they figured that they flew in 10,000 hookers 
Okay. Because I was, I was wondering, you know, if human trafficking is such a great concern, I think illegal immigration probably feeds it the most. I would agree with you. You know, and might be a way to turn their heads towards securing our borders more. Well, um, I don't there's know. another way you can secure a border, uh, and that's another bill I put in that was promised it would have a vote, and a vote never happened. And maybe you can agree or disagree, but it's called E-Verify. E-Verify is a system whereby whenever you get hired by anybody, uh -huh. if I hire you or if they hire Dave Ageman, I've got to give my name and my social security number, probably my driver's license. Well, I put a bill in that said anybody that's doing work for the state uh, or subcontractor for the state has to be E-Verified. Uh, I got that passed in Oakland County and Macomb County. Oakland County alone, as soon as they passed that bill, got rid of 200 people working for them, and 200 Michiganders got jobs. And they were working on roads and building buildings and so forth. That's just Oakland County. No, I put it in for the state, but it was never allowed to vote because people came out against it. CARE came out against it. Council on American Islamic Relations, other groups did too as well. And all that does is e-verifies a system, free homeland security system run by the federal government, no new data. All it does is say, okay, uh, business A that works for the government or works for the state is getting hired. His name is Dave Ageman. Here's a social security number. So that secretary punches that button. It sends that my name and social security number over to Washington cross-checks 450 million documents. Does it say, does that social security number match the name? Uh, is he overextended on a green card or a worker's permit? And if it doesn't match any of those three, it comes back non-confirmed. It means you're either looking at an illegal or somebody just got married and didn't change their, you know, their name to match with a social security number. And never has an American or a U.S. citizen been denied a job because of E-Verify. But there's been a whole lot of people lose their job because they were not here legally. And I still contest, contend, anywhere else you go in the world, you can't do it. If we would just adopt Mexico's rules on working, you know what they do? They say, we will hunt you down. It's a two-year right off the bat in the jail, second time ten years, and you probably won't survive that jail. They're not nice. In addition to those policies, mainly liberal and Democrat, or is there... Uh, uh, there's both. Again, money is involved. Who's making money on the illegals? No, well, everybody's making money on them, but uh, for example, uh, I had a guy come in and testify, and he was a cement contractor. And he says, I can't bid against these guys uh, because I know what they're doing, but I can't prove it. I mean, they're paying their guys eight bucks an hour. I got to pay mine 18 to 25 bucks an hour. They can outbid me. They get the job. I got to lay my people off. My people go on welfare and unemployment. That's not right. And I swore to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And boy, when that happens, when I see that happen, I'm not upholding my oath if I don't do something about that. But that bill was never allowed to come to the floor. So I pulled a fast one on the Speaker of the House. When you put a bill in, and it's sitting in committee, and it's sitting in committee, and they never take a vote on it, I have a right as a legislator to take that bill, stand in front on the House floor, which I did, and I said I'd discharge bill, House Bill 4769 uh, uh, for any further consideration on a vote. Well, then the next day they have to decide what they're going to do. That was just prior to the election. The Speaker of the House says, well, we'll take that up after the election on such and such a date. Everybody called me, oh, we're going to have a vote. I said, no, you're not. He's going to bury that bill. And sure enough, after the election, that bill just was never allowed to come up for a vote. That's the games they play. Now, if that would have happened before the election, somebody might have not have won. Just because people are fed up with that, with the illegal immigration. <laughs> that was Judy Emmons. What's that? Yeah, Judy Emmons had the bill, did you say? Or the information on human trafficking. And she's working on that. She's a senator. Okay. Other questions? Anything at all? Oh, I, I don't know. Because our president. No, 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 I'm just pointing. He's one for the microphone. Because our president has committed so many offenses that are worthy of impeachment. And because he has threatened many times that, well, if you don't do what I want, I'll just sign an executive order. 
Why is everybody so afraid of pursuing because the to impeachment? Because impeach somebody, it's going to require, uh, what is it, two-thirds vote? I can't remember, two-thirds or three-quarters of the House and the Senate. The Senate's owned by the Democrats. They'll never vote for it. They'll never vote for that. But yeah, we've got more czars than Russia does now. We've got all kinds of executive orders, which are bills being made by Obama. He should be. But it'll never happen because they won't impeach their own. The Democrats are better than Republicans. The, when's the last time you heard a Democrat really come out and hammer another Democrat? Yep. We eat our own. Democrats are quiet. And they just sit there and, and never come out. Could you speak, uh, I think some people might have um, interest as to what happened with Marco Rubio. You know, he was, uh, he was elected and, and it was like he, he was presidential. And then on the immigration, he just did some of the most screwy things. What do you think really happened there? I think he stuck his foot in his mouth because he was for uh, amnesty. And the vast majority of Americans are not. I mean, why does it make sense to take in millions of more people when you have people that can't find a job? It doesn't make any sense. So I think he just buried himself on that one alone. Why do you think he held that position? You know, he, he I thought he was a constitutionalist. That. That guy. I can't answer that. But if you want to make real confusion in the Democrat Party, <laughs> you know what a really good ticket would be? Just have a Colonel West, black guy, and uh, the doctor, Dr. Carlson, run as president and vice president. Democrats wouldn't know what to do. Two conservative black men, and they're good. Wes is really good. I met him, talked to him. And Carson is a really good guy. Really good guy. Oh, he had one over here. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, why are you here tonight? Because he asked me to come. Oh. You know what I mean? What's, your, what's the object of... Uh, Just to inform you what's going on uh, and to let you know that uh, we need people to get involved in the process. You can't be just sit there at home watching TV and getting all your news from the TV because it's not accurate. I can tell you that right now. I'll tell you one time, they, the news media came to my door, and uh, uh, I didn't know who he was. He was just dressed in, you know, whatever. He came into my living room. We were talking. My wife comes up there and says, who's this? I said, well, they're from TV, whatever channel. I'm not happy with you, my wife said, because you did not report this accurately. You know what the newspaper said the next day? Ajima unhappy with news media. Yeah, there was an Ajima. It was my wife, but it wasn't me. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff they pull. No, but what I was wondering is, um, you know, with the new Republicans now looking more like the old Democrat, yeah. and the Democrats going farther to the left, mm -hmm. are, are you here to represent the RNC? I'm when, here to tell you that you have a two-party system right now. If a group splits off from the Republican Party, it's guaranteed you're going to have Democrat rule. They'll reverse everything. Now, I don't agree with some of the, the quasi-liberal you know, liberal people in the GOP, but I'm telling you, take it from the inside out. Get involved in the party. Change the party. Get those people that represent you that are delegates and so forth and change it because the, the other option is going to be horrendous. And I served with Shower, who wants to run for the governor. He is grand home on steroids. <laughs> uh, not good thing. I know the man, and I don't agree with everything, you know, that the governor's done. I don't agree with Common Core. I don't agree with Medicaid expansion. I don't agree with his new bridge. And I chaired transportation. I know that issue. I could talk about that for half an hour, explain why we don't need that and what should happen. But uh, I, I'm here to speak what's going on, why I'm taking flack, and to tell you, you got to get involved, you got to write letters, and you people got to run for things. You're, you're right, too. And the reason why we're here tonight, me and my friend, is simply because you're here. Oh. Because oh. you spoke up. Thanks. You, you defended yourself when you needed to. That's, and you're right. That's what we all need to do. You do. So I, th but, I thank But I will you. tell you one thing. There, one thing you can't do is when they start slamming you, like I talked about earlier, where they have all kinds of news articles and the radio and the television, you can't respond to all those. That's what they want you to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. we literally, I, and that's not my personality. I'm a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. I want to go run and wring your neck, you know. <laughs> so what I had to do is sit back, and my wife said, we got to pray about this. 
And you know what we're finding out? It's coming out of the woodwork in the Republican Party who the real liberals are. We just identified them. Mm -hmm. Because bet. they're coming out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. So there's a target. <laughs> target rich environment, as we'd say in the military. It's, it seems to me that the Republicans have missed some golden opportunities, particularly with Obamacare, but what prompted it was the czars. Why do, aren't there ads about, hey, Russia got rid of their czar in 1917. We just got 26 yep. new czars in 2008 yep. from Obama. But Obamacare, why aren't they that? If you're unhappy with this legislation, just remember, every Democrat voted for it, not one Republican voted for it. You should have voted Republican. Actually, they're putting that out. And uh, they, they've talked about the czars. I put out a newsletter. And again, if you want to put your name and an email, I can put you on a newsletter that I put out about once a month as well. They do. And that All that stats I gave you a while ago on how much debt we have and how much all this, that's all in my newsletter. And that comes from the RNC. Uh, they are putting it out. But again, you have, to get, you have to have a media that's willing to print this stuff. And the media is not on our side. They are just not on our side. You're buying political ads. You're, you're, yep. That's the first thing I do. I forget me. This is what the Democrats have given me. I th and you will see that. They're going to be doing that. And actually, I was in Washington, and I went down and saw what the RNC has. And my brother and I have some very interesting discussions. I'm a Republican, and he's a Democrat. He married a Democrat. It wore off on him. And uh, so when we got there, I said, okay, let me see your database. Look me up. Hardcore, super conservative. Da -da 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 -da. Look up my brother. And they had him as a mild Democrat because he voted once for a Republican, me, when I ran for office. <laughs> but they had him right down. And they know what magazines, I mean, it's amazing how much information is out there on the person. Which brings up another interesting thing, why, and you know lots of political people, when they start saying Fox News is right, or you're, you know, I remember with the Obamacare, they kept asking, where's the moderate Republicans? Why didn't somebody say, where's the moderate Democrats? And when they say, oh, the Republican extreme right, well, yeah, you're so far left that even... The well, think of this. Right. Think of the people that we put up for office. We have never won with a moderate. We have never won with a moderate. Reagan came in there from behind. Nobody thought he could win. And he won. Uh, now they changed some rules at the RNC. Some people aren't real happy about that. I won't get into the rule changes. Most of you aren't interested in that probably anyway. But uh, under the rule changes that they made now, Reagan might not even been able to probably get into that fight. So... Uh, I don't think we can win with a moderate. And the base doesn't want a moderate. But again, there's the opinion of some that we have to have this big wide tent. We have to have more people in it. I says, if you put the wrong people in the tent, the other people are going to walk away from the tent. And that's, I have talked to more Tea Party groups and independent groups than anybody else has in the state. And like I've said before, most of them say, I didn't leave the Republican Party, they left me. So my goal is to keep them in change it from within because we have to maintain principles and Colonel West said that in Los Angeles he said when it comes to principles we have to stand like a rock in a fast moving stream and not budge and that's what we have to do Still, uh, opportunities here for questions spreading it around a little bit any uh, are there others that have a question you'd like to ask okay, on you Paul up here. in front and then Chet over here I'm uh, I'm getting awfully weary. We go to our. It's not on. Talk straight into it. Talk, yeah, talk. Put it right straight like that. We're we're getting weary. Can you hear me? I hear you. Okay. <laughs> I hear you. Trust me. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> I I go to our mailbox every day, and we probably have one to two pounds of letters from every kind of organization you can think of. Yeah. I don't even have time to open those letters and read them. And a lot of them are probably conservative, but they're from all different angles. I take 99% of them and put them straight in the trash without even opening them. 
Then another thing. As soon as it turns 9 o'clock in the morning. Phone rings. And it just rings continuously. Me too. We don't, we don't answer those kind of calls. Yep. Then we get what they call emails. Mm -hmm. You know, and we get blasted. So we're weary. We don't know what to do. I believe there's some good people. But I don't have time to wade through all that junk mail. Mm -hmm. And it seems like every week there's a new organization we've never even heard of. And we don't have time to read all that kind of mail. I would just like to support some good, solid, Bible-believing, conservative people that believe in the Constitution. But I don't want to be bothered with hundreds and hundreds of letters every week from every kind of organization there is. You are one of many. And even me too, but I do one thing better than you do. I don't throw them in the trash. I can wad them up and burn them in my little fireplace and I give heat, so it's a good thing. But uh, I will say, uh, go to michiganvotes.org and that'll tell you how your people are voting. And, and then you got other, uh, other organizations like, core, what's the core principles, the one that Hogan Dyke puts out? They'll tell you how your people voted on various issues and you'll find out. Uh, some of the individuals are not voting the way they said they should. But you really need to be aware, and most people are not aware. They just come up to their senator or their representative and they say, oh, he's a nice guy, I really like this guy. How's he vote? I don't know. He's just a nice guy. Yeah, but he votes liberal. Then you might as well have a dem in there. So michiganvotes.org will tell you how your people vote. Look at that. It's very important. And you'll be surprised who some of the liberals are. Federally, I don't know where you can look up, but you can probably just get on the internet and just say, uh, how do my congressmen vote, federal congressmen vote, and it'll pop up several of those where you can find out how they vote on issues. Anybody else? Yes, as, as a part of the uh, Republican Executive Committee, I would like to have more people out. Sometimes we only have 20 people out on a, on a Thursday night. We meet the first Thursday night in White Cloud, Michigan, every month. And, you know, we need people to help us and to get started and to uh, work forward, plan ahead in order to get conservative people into our government. Yep. We have everyone that is running for an office. We invite everyone that's running for an office in to bring their presentation. And last um, election, we had a fellow that was running as a Republican and never attended a single meeting and never even came to speak to us. He turned us down. And the thing is, we've got to work together, as Dave says. You know, there's a spot here and a spot there, but you can't do anything. It's just like the news media. You got five news medias that's supporting the president, mm -hmm. one or two that's not. He's getting a lot of free advertisement. Yeah. But people, as Dave said, we have got to band together or we're going to sink the ship. Yeah. How can we fight the corruption? And you know what I'm saying with Obama and the SARS and what Well, <clears throat> the best thing you can do, in my opinion, if you're not a delegate, or even if you are a delegate, look what you do. If you write a letter to the editor and it's printed, it reaches hundreds of thousands of people. Okay. Write them. We're not doing it. I mean, the liberals are writing them all the time. I swear they have a group of people that are 100 people that they write two letters, three letters a month, and they get them printed. Yep. And another thing... I know there's this idea that separation of church exists, but it really doesn't. It's not in the Constitution. The whole purpose of that was that the government cannot tell you as a Christian or whatever you are what you got to be or what you can do. Churches need to get involved because we're dealing with issues now that are dealing with your Christianity. And we are dealing with a small group of people that got a lot of money and that are influential and they're going to change the nation for traditional marriage. And I'll guarantee you, your kids are already being taught this in school. Yeah, in Hawaii. Now, not just Hawaii. Yeah, I don't the other one. Now, my point is, and I got trouble for saying this, okay, if you're going to teach that to my kids, yep. can you please bring in a medical doctor and say, okay, if you choose this, here's what you can expect to happen. Yep. You want the CDC? From, you want Oxford University of Epidemiology Study? They're, go on my webpage. They're up bunch of them on there and it'll tell you what you can expect to happen to you. Now that costs more money in healthcare as well. But oh, you're 
homophobic when you do that. No, it's just common sense. Yeah. Yeah. So get involved. My grandson, six years old, in a Colorado school, came home in a science class. He said, Mommy, did you know it's okay for a man to marry a man? Yep. My science teacher yes. told me that today. Yes. Yep. She took him out of school the next year. Now my question is, the homeschoolers, mm -hmm. are they going to have problems? I, I think they may be starting to have problems. They are. The homeschoolers are going to have to teach to the same test of Common Core yeah. that the public schools are going to be taught. But that is different. That particular issue, the parent at least is dealing with that and can tell the kid what's what. Uh, but my my daughter, oldest daughter, uh, she's homeschooling now because of this. So I'm just telling you, parents, we've let it, let the state educate our kids. We got to take a bigger role in our kids. Dave, I want to ask um, a couple of move it in the spiritual direction sure. a little bit. If others will go that direction too for a moment. But um, I I went to that one uh, gathering that was in in Lansing. You spoke. Dick Thompson spoke. I think it was uh, Nona Darwish. Was she there? Was that the ALEC meeting? The, yeah, at the ALEC meeting. Um, and I, she said, she, I think she was talking about activism, and she said she'd kind of come to the conclusion uh, that activism was in the bloodstream. And what I'm saying from that is that it seems like from the standpoint of, of churches, you know, with all the people that attend churches, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of fire in the belly. I mean, we see that election after election. You know, it, the homosexual group and the, the radical left, they seem to have that, that fire. But it just, seem, just, it just seems again and again and again that it's, uh, it's, it's only, it's a small core. Is, is, that the, is it the remnant? Is that what it takes? Yes. Is that all we have then to go on is, is the remnant? It and is, so therefore but you're we're being gonna... desensitized because every time you turn on the TV, every time you go watch a movie, every time you do anything, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's yeah. there. So you're being desensitized so people just start to gradually accept it. And then I want to follow that by saying you and Barbara, um, you know, for you to continue to stand, it can't just be enough to be constitution and principles. It's got to be bedrock faith. Oh, no and question. I'd like to have you speak to that. Where well, does that come from and how do you keep that fire going? I think, I'm going to get a little teary-eyed here, but uh, we had to get on our knees, especially me. And I had to start getting up in the morning and I had to start reading my Bible and praying. And before I go to bed, I do the same. And throughout the day, even before I come here, I said, okay, Lord, we're going to tape this thing. I'm probably going to say something I get in trouble for again. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why do I fear that? Why do I have to fear that in America? What is that freedom of speech we talked about? So I'm just telling you, he hit it when he said, I've learned I had to change because I was just a Christian in name only. It takes reading and praying and asking God for mercy. And I just want to add to that, um, never in my wildest dreams did I ever expect to be, be the woman behind the man who's being persecuted. But when I think about how I grew up in a Christian home, in a Christian school, um, all my friends were Christians. I went on a summer workshop in missions. I've, I've been on missions trips. But I always wondered, Lord, what would I do if I had to die for my faith? I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could be a martyr. There are more martyrs today than ever before in Surreal. history. And I'm going to tell you something. I never planned to be here. I still don't feel like a martyr. But I do feel persecuted because I'm with my husband. So don't ever think that it can happen to you, that God's not going to put you in that place. I never, ever expected to see age of my name in the headlines and on the news. You don't know what you're going to take on if you just decide to follow God's plan. And like I said before, God's got a plan for every one of us. He gave every one of us a mouth. He gave us the same word, the same principles, the same Savior, because we all sin. That's our bottom line. We all have sinned. Dave and I have been Christians and grown up together. 
But our faith has never been tried like it is today. We've never, ever gotten into the Word to feed upon it. Not just read it, but to feed upon it. And to do what it says. And to realize God is our protector. He is my shield. He's my strength. He's my armor every single day. And we all need that. We all need that. And Dave, I have to, I want to say, don't you believe that if, if we are going to save this country, it's going to take that very kind of commitment, and it's going to take trials and tribulation and being marked and like you, you guys. expect it to happen. It's got to happen, doesn't the it? The Bible says it's going to happen. They persecuted the prophets. They persecuted Jesus. They persecuted his disciples. You got to decide if you're willing to take that stand. And then the Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. Expect it. But you know what? There's safety in numbers. And there's a lot of churches out there. Let's get, let's get going. We can change this. We can turn this around. We just got to decide we're going to do it. But it starts with each individual. Um, I know that, uh, you know, this, this administration has had a, uh, uh, they've had, you know, they collect more data than any other, they've invaded our privacy more than any other, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, if the, the, the founding fathers were living in our day and time, they would have revolted a long time ago to this type of oppression. I mean, I'm, I, to be honest with you, I'm scared to go and buy ammunition at the store because I know the government's tracking it. I can't, you can't swipe a credit card without them taking some type of note of it. And now, you know, you're telling me that you have your voting record and they have you as an extreme, extreme conservative. You know, I know at ch my church, we have to edit all the videos we put on, on, on the internet because you know, if we say anything against homosexuality, they'll come and take our tax exemption status. And no, they can't do that yet. Oh, uh, well. You can speak out. Yeah, I, I know that they told us that, or the, uh, one of the, the there's a lot of uh, teens at our church, or not teens, but young adults, and I understand, you know, the Democrats, their strong point is they have the, the youth marketed, or t uh, cornered, because, you know, they're indoctrinated. And I sure. think that uh, the colleges, uh, I think I've always thought that was a racket. I didn't go to uh, college myself. I went to MCC, and um, but you know uh, I feel like the uh, student loans are all federal student loans, and I think that's a tax that you know a form of taxation. And I thought that a long time ago that we should have more internships to you know get 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 people to work. But I guess I don't know where I'm going with this, but I'm just I'm what sick you're of saying is the youth are being indoctrinated. Yeah, and I, you know, and now he wants to he wants to do the the pre-education so he can get your kids at younger ages, and it's just it's outrageous, and I'm I'm sick of it to be honest with you, I and I don't I don't you know I I so I, what do you do? This gentleman here said I need help, help, volunteer, get in there, folk, be a delegate, be involved, and bring your Christian principles to bear. Because if you don't, the other side is. So you've got to make up your mind whether you want to just be a bystander or you want to get involved. I mean, I never thought I was going to do this either. But I decided to do it because I couldn't stand politicians. Just remember, politics comes from two words. You all heard that, right? Poly meaning many and text being a blood-sucking insect. If you remember that, you'll keep it. In. <laughs> One more question, and then I'd like to close. And, uh, um, and Dave, you'll be able to be available sure. for a few minutes afterwards yep. out there, right? One other question here. You know, I uh, I just see around the the neighborhood and everything. I see that nobody pays attention to anybody. Mm -hmm. And if we want to be a united party, if we want to be a united anything, we need to go on the concept that Jesus said, "Love one another as I have loved you." And we need to walk down to our neighbor's house. We need to check on our elderly. We need to relate to people and have contact with them around us. Know who your neighbor is and love them, take care of them, do something for them. Just go down and check on them and we'll, we'll be a lot better off. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, my friend Kamal Salim, a former Muslim brother ter terrorist who's now Christian, he said the best way to disarm a Muslim is to love them. 
because I'm not used to that. I mean, 86% or 84% of that religion is how you eat, how you sleep, how you treat an infidel, and so forth. It's only like 14 or 16% religion. So I've got to make a comment about Kamal Salim, yep. because uh, he, we had him here oh. uh, last year, and uh, before we and then we we took him down to Grand Rapids, and then of course we heard from the Grand Rapids press that he's a fraud, yeah. you know, that he's a this and he's a that. And uh, so, you know, even in our community, there, I'm sure there were there were there were few though. He was he was very well received here. I'm, this is a um, rhetorical question. You've already answered in a sense, but is Kamal Salim real or is he a fraud? Let's put it this way: <clears throat> when we had our little incident down there in Allegan when he was speaking, tell him about that, would you? A little bit. Uh, a guy by the name of Mark Gurley paid 800 bucks to get him to come down, and some other people put him up at the house. And then we told the uh, school who was coming in, uh, I was going to brief ALEC, American Law for American Courts. Uh, and then the, there was a commissioner there that got to school. Uh, CARE Council on American Islamic Relations put articles in the paper, says don't get this guy, he's a fake, da 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 da. That's the first thing right there. If CARE comes out against somebody, it's probably just the opposite of what they're saying. Uh, but when that whole thing hit, uh, I called up Homeland Security. And they said to me, we don't have any problem with Kamal. We have big problems with CARE, but not Kamal. And then, three-star General Boykin, used to be head of Delta Force, he says, I used to hunt this guy. I know what he is. He's real. So, I mean, they go together once in a while, Kamal and uh, General Boykin go and speak. But again, under this administration, there's been a flip on what they're willing to accept. Uh, and now they're changing their tune, and they don't want to hear anything about anybody who's speaking out against radical Islam. Matter of fact, they're even taking the word terrorists and other things out of their military manuals. We are now the terrorists, terrorists, Christians, Second Amendment people, and so forth, which is unbelievable. Unbelievable to me. So, yes, do I think he's real? I'm the biggest critic you're ever going to want. When the first time I met him, I thought, I'm going to listen to this guy, see what I think. And I listened to him, I thought, okay, that was good, I'm going to listen to him again. And then I went with him about three or four times, and I, before that I met with General Boykin. And then I called Homeland Security. He's the real deal. If you get his book, you want a, a, a read that you will not want to put down. I don't like to read. Ever since I got my master's degree, I thought I don't like books anymore. Uh, but get the book called Blood of the Lambs. Blood of the Lambs by Salim. And it tells how he got into the Muslim Brotherhood. As a young age of seven, he was running guns into Israel to kill, kill the Jews. And he talks about his conversion. And he came to America to try to convince people they should be Muslims. And before he could do anything, he got in a severe accident, nearly killed them, and he had to live in a doctor's house because he had nowhere to go. He said, I couldn't tell him I was a Muslim Brotherhood terrorist. What could I tell him? So he was converted by living in that Christian home. And then he got married, and in a 9-11, uh, when that hit, he was just agitated like crazy, and his wife didn't, didn't even know he was into that when he was younger. And then he confessed to his wife. His wife was a Christian. And his wife said, you know what? For such a time as this, you need to speak out. And that's what started his ministry. So, interesting guy. I love the guy. And he always comes up to me, gives me a hug, and kisses me on the neck. It's kind of squirrely at first. <laughs> but he always does that, you know. That's what they do. So, Dave, as we close, I'd like to, um, I'd like to have you, if, I'd like to have Barbara come down with you. I'd like to have us um, gather together, anybody that would like to come forward, if you don't mind. And, and I got onion breath from the pizza. Lay, lay hands on you. And I'd like to have Vic, and would you, would you mind praying for him as well, leading in prayer? Well, I just want to pray, have some prayer for you guys. Sure. Okay? Let's gather. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you to lay hands on Dave Ajima and his wife here and lift him up before you, Lord. We know we're entering into a dark time. But, you know, as they say, it's always darkest before the light. Amen. And we thank you that you've given us the answer and the, the end game in your, in your word. And we already know what's going to happen. And we know that you're victorious and the blood of Jesus has kept us all safe and sanctified. And we thank you for this. And we thank you for people like Dave that uh, are willing to carry his cross daily and bear it and be salt and light. And thank you. And please give us all the strength and your grace that we may be salt and light and be able to spread your word, Amen. you know, and we want to bring as many people to the kingdom of God as we can in this short time. Amen. We know that the devil's going to throw everything at us that he can because his time is short and he's scared, Lord, and you're the winner, and we know it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Heavenly Father, we just think of the cross and all that darkness and that came against you in the light of the world. You carried it all. Yes. And then you gave up your life. And life began when you arose for us. I also know, Lord, that the disciples and the Christians at that time were hunted down and they were scattered all over, but they were set afire after Pentecost of the, and being filled. And then from that point on, the fires were blazing everywhere. And I also remember for your scriptures, Lord, of Gideon and the breaking of the pitcher and the, um, the shining of the lights and the sword of the Lord and Gideon and the enemy ended up slaying each other. Yeah. So we thank you, Lord, what you have done for us, you've shown to us, and what you've given to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of gathering together with other like believers and, and strong constitutional conservatives, Lord. We, we thank you for uh, bringing Brother Dave Agema here and the encouragement and, and how he has uh, helped to fan the flames in our hearts and in our lives to stand up for what is right. We just thank you for him and his wife as a team as a rock that's in that stream that he illustrated that's running so quickly but yet you can hold them firm and strong and we just pray that they can feel our prayers from this day forward that they're not alone that we'll be standing with them in any way you can guide and show us how to we pray in your precious holy name Amen, Amen.